This episode of the Major Issues Podcast is brought to you by Patreon.com slash CBC Clubhouse. Comic book clickers on Patreon, guys. For as little as 10 cents a day or $3 a month, not only can you help keep the lights on here at Comic Book Click Headquarters, but your donation gives you access to exclusive content like CBC commentaries, polls where you can choose what content we cover next, and special behind-the-scenes footage of things here at Comic Book Click. Visit patreon.com slash CBC Clubhouse today and become a Patreon. And remember, you, yes you, are worthy. Hello everybody out there in comic book land. My name is George Serrano, aka The Don, and if you're listening to this, you can only be around for one reason, and it's a brand new episode of the Major Issues Podcast, brought to you by ComicBookClick.com, and as always, I am never alone. Sir, can you please introduce yourself? I am Dan, the comic book man. Dan, the comic book man is here, breaking another streak, another appearance on the Major Issues Podcast, but we're not even alone. Sir, can you please introduce yourself? I am Dave of the Department of Nerds. Dave from the Department of Nerds podcast, which if you haven't been listening, get on it. They've been doing live streams on Facebook every Tuesday covering the latest and greatest things that come to comic books and comic book media. They're doing some fine work over there, but I had to bring him in here because Dave, I consider you a winner and I consider Daniel a winner. And I had to keep my winners around me for this particular episode in which we will be deep diving into the losers, uh, something that has just recently come across everybody's mind as it's been on Netflix. And people have started to realize that this might be a, a diamond in a rough and a hidden gem, if you will. Dave, can you remember uh, your first memories about this film? Uh, I remember I was deployed at the time when I first saw it. And it wow. was, yeah, definitely trying to get a torrent rip of this thing. A good quality one was difficult yes, yes, <laughs> yes did you like like it on first watch oh absolutely it, it was it was entertaining it, i laughed quite a bit I mean, there were cheesy parts but you're gonna find that in any comic book based movie yeah uh, but it was overall it was it became it quickly landed as one of my favorite comic book movies to ever watch it's it's incredible as i'm looking back on it now it's incredibly 2000s right like oh, it's, 100%. it's quint, quintessential Whoa. 2000s and as somebody who watches a ton of films dan how did you feel going back to the losers was it everything you remembered and more oh it, there, there was definitely nothing i forgot about this movie i remembered everything about this movie it's it's fast paced it's so fast i found myself looking at the time not because it was dragging i found myself looking at the time because it's like holy crap i'm already in the second act what's going right. on like like I, sometimes, you know, it's a good thing to have long movies. It's like this movie is at least an hour and 30 minutes of just movie. Well, we're getting to a point, right, where these studios are getting more and more comfortable laying down three hours worth of content. Uh, our boy Snyder put a what, a four hour <laughs> film up. The suicide <laughs> was two and a half hours. And, if, and it w- was well paced and enjoyable. Uh, what do you think about the much shorter runtime, Dave? Um. It- <sighs> There was so much more they could have done with the movie. Yeah. There was so much more they could have added to it, but I loved it for the sole fact that there was never a slow moment. I agree. I agree with that as well. You could do, you could have drawn out so many scenes in that movie and it still would have made for a great flick. Yeah. But I'm glad they didn't extend it to the 2-hour mark. I, I think one I think it was an hour 36 minutes. I think Daniel hit it right on the head. Hour 36 minutes was perfect. And that includes a, a mid credit scene. Yes. Yes. Um, what I really liked about this was, like you said, it, it kind of goes off in a clip. And it, just like some comic books, it doesn't really pay attention to much of the details. Like those, the, real, the, the nitty gritty of the stuff doesn't matter. In other films where they would take time to explain the science of certain things or, you know, go over certain things. This is a lot of explosions, a lot of gunfire, um, a lot of operative stuff. But it's really, really fun. And I wonder, and I'll pose this question uh, to you, Dave, first, and then I'll ask Dan. Do you think this film would have worked with a different cast? Because this, we got some heavy hitters in this, some people that will go on to hold, you know, court in, 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 in geek fandom, uh, you know, with Idris Elba. We got Chris Evans. We got Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Zoe Saldana. Um, 
it, so many names. Do you think this film could have still worked with a bunch of, let's say, I mean, I was going to say with a bunch of no name actors, but some of these guys weren't necessarily ringing bells in 2010. What do you think, Dave? I, I think you would have got different acting styles. If you didn't go with this set of people, you would have got different acting styles and it could have been because I don't think the budget for this movie was very was all that high. Like they had enough to spend on some names to draw people in because this is one of those lesser known comic books. Yes, 100 um, percent. So they used name recognition to draw people in. Right. And I think if you if you got lesser known actors like I, the guy who played Pooch, I am not 100. I've never seen him before or not Pooch um, Cougar. Yeah, I've never seen him before in my life until this movie. <laughs> Has but he been much who, since? Uh, no, I, what, what's his name? Oscar, Oscar Gen- Haneda? Haneda. Wow, he looks crazy right now. <laughs> he looks a bit crazy right now. Uh, I'm looking through his filmography. I'm not, it's a lot of Spanish stuff. He was, oh, what the heck? He was in Sp- Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, but it says his character was El Espanol. <laughs> oh, so the one you haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've seen I've seen Stranger I've seen is Stranger Times the last one? No, that's no. that's that's um I I haven't seen the last one out of protest. I can't remember which one. So you saw the one with Penelope Cruz. Yeah, I thought that was Stranger Tides. I think that is Stranger Tides. Yeah, so I think I think he's just playing one of the Spaniards in that, which seemingly it probably doing, a very minor role he's been doing throughout his career. Um yeah, go ahead, brother. But Columbus Short, I've seen him in a few things before. He was perfect for like that kind of minor but still main team actor. Yeah. Because he wasn't the main part of the team. He wasn't the main focus, but he was very integral to the story. But for Clay, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, I think, knocked it out of the park. And same thing with Roke, Idris Elba. Like that, I was like getting those two names right there drew in everybody you needed. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I will say this. There is one person I know you cannot replace, and that was Jason Patrick playing max <laughs> yeah, he's he was perfect yeah. he is by far one of my favorite villains for these comic book movies yeah Top i agree i down. was i was very surprised I, unlike you two i have seen this film and I, I but i just don't remember much about it so it was almost like i was watching it for the first time and you can't help but be entertained by <laughs> max the villain of this oh, film he was so brilliant and just the flippant nature that he talks about people's lives and all that kind of stuff it is, you know, it, it's got to be a bit refreshing. But this film also takes place during that time period of like Fast and Furious and Bad mm-hmm. Boys, right? Where there was always this like kind of charismatic suited villain trying to blow up the world or sell a bunch I of I mean, drugs. it was basically him and Patrick Wilson trying to like do their best that same year. What do you Patrick think? Patrick Wilson though, was very charismatic the- in the A-team. With a different cast, though, you think this could have? No. Well? No, not no, at all. no, I because I, I've read so far, I've read seven, I've read the first volume, which okay. is basically half this movie. Yeah. And everybody, everybody did what they were supposed to do. Zoe Saldana and Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Chris Evans, they are irreplaceable in this role. Maybe Columbus Short, you know, get another guy that looks like, but Chris Evans alone, you cannot do another person to play Jensen. He was the perfect Jensen. Yeah, and I just feel like if they Morgan made that movie now, that look for some reason, every time Jeffrey Dean Morgan is casted as a comic book character, he literally looks like the him. It's like if they drew <laughs> with him in mind, ne- Negan, very same, even mm-hmm. comedian before this man was probably even born, oh, he looked, yeah. he looks like the comedian. Yeah, he's um, he's great in this, and one of the things I think is also understated about him is he has a killer voice. He has a killer, oh, he just has like one of the best voices. badass, low, low, yes. uh, low trouble kind of voice there uh, going on there. I think if they would have made this movie, let's say last year, I think Ryan Reynolds probably would have been Jensen. They would have yeah. some kind of, yeah. some kind of, you know, uh, jokey. Well, uh, they person. still could, they still could have used Chris Evans because he still had he was he had the same mindset from the losers, but just put more of an asshole twist on it when he was in Knives Out. Yeah. He had the jokey, he had the, you know, roasting people, just the, just the dumb attitude about it. But he was he was a dick in Knives Out. Right. And I'm sorry, this is my first time on your show. Is cussing aloud? I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, all right, cool. Especially um, on the losers. <laughs> but <laughs> ahead, I, I agree with Daniel. He, he was hand, he's hands down irreplaceable. 
Then you actually went down a rabbit hole. I want to say this morning in his love for Chris Evans. He started to look through his, uh, you know, filmography. You want to talk a little bit about that? Dan? I don't, I don't think Chris Evans has ever not played a comedic role. Like in, sort in of so, comedic in some sort of way. It doesn't matter what movie setting he is besides Snowpiercer. He's always in some sort of way being able to, to be jokey or be the butt of a joke. I mean, you're supposed to feel bad for Steve Rogers in the first Captain America movie, but you just can't help but just see this little pencil in like, you know, a roll <laughs> of pencil. giant bread. Like he's yeah. just <laughs> he's so small. It, it right. push push with the same thing. And he's basically like a like a a, a straight man yeah. being thrusted into this world of of super villains and thrillers. Like he's I don't think he's ever he's played Lucas Lee. <laughs> Lucas Lucas Lee alone. It's one of his greatest performances. He's probably one of the greatest actors ever. Just looking yeah. back on everything this this man has done, he has managed to just chameleon every role. I think it just shows like the, the kind of projects that he takes on, right? The projects that he chooses um, really get to stretch out his acting muscles in this. And speaking of like stretching things out, this only had a budget of twenty five million. Ooh. Oh my god, that's beautiful. That's very small compared to some of the. I'm these, really surprised by that. On here. And I, I guess it's because it was a comic, right? Like, I think they were really just looking at this like, I don't want to put too much money behind it. If it would have been an original script or something, I feel like they would have shoveled a lot more money onto this. But it, because it was a dark, I mean, a, sorry, a Vertigo comic of all things. Um, I think it's because it was a Vertigo comic. Yeah, because I'm, this came out in 2010 and Iron Man was out. Hulk was out. They were working on Iron Man 2, Thor. All yeah. those movies, phase one of the Avengers. So they weren't afraid of comic book. Oh movies. my God. This was a year before this man puts on the shield. Yup. He didn't know, what he, didn't know before... what he was doing, bro. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on there. <laughs> oh my God. This guy did. Oh, knocked and, and out the I have a point. Too. What's Go up? ahead, brother. I got a point for you, Daniel. Um, you were talking about how he's uh, serious roles for Chris Evans. Uh, he played Mr. Freezy in the Iceman. The Richard Kuklinski uh, biopic? Yes, yes. With um. Oh wow! What's his name? I forgot he was in that Zod. with uh, Michael Shannon. Yeah. Wow, there's a movie with Michael Shannon and Chris Evans in it. Michael Shannon. <laughs> oh, oh wait, Iceman. they're in they're in Knives Out together. No. Yes, they are. Oh, yeah, they are. That's two. They're, Check that they're out. Wow. My nephew in Knives Out. Uh, it's it's a hell of a um, it, it's a hell of a company to be around in 2010. Seemingly, I'm looking at a lot of good films that came out. Uh, we had. Scott Pilgrim versus the world was 2010. So great. Um, I think under the red hood is 2010. Well, also, you know, really, really big stuff. We also got super in 2010. So James, my Gunn is God, we, we break into the stuff. 2010s with comic book movies right out the gate with the most randomest adaptations. But then you got Jonah Hex too. So <laughs> things, oh, yeah, things, that's you right. know. Jonah Hex is still that year, man. DC had a banner it, year. It is the ups and downs of, of the comic book world. But I do think that this deserves its own place in it. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised when they listen to this podcast to find out that this is actually a comic book film. I think there's a lot of people who had no idea. And, you know, one of the other films that we covered here, which was that Tom Hanks film, uh, Dan? Was oh, it Tom uh, Hanks? No, Vigo, Vigo Mortensen we did, right? And that, was, that was, yeah, we did History of Violence. We have yet to do The Road to Perdition. <laughs> But History of Violence is a, I didn't know that was a comic book film. And boom, comic book film. So I found that because remember yeah. when we were in Level Up together? That's where I found it because they were doing votes of the best comic book movies. And I'm like, wait, History of Violence and Road to Perdition were comic book movies? Since yeah. when? Hist History of Violence is one of my favorite, like top 10 favorite movies of all time. That's a comic book movie? Oh, yeah. God, the comic book is so much better. Yeah. This comic book, there is, there well, is the no movie was magnificent. Yeah. Don't yeah, that's the so Dan's only issue is that the the comic book doesn't have this sex on a staircase scene, which I <laughs> which I say is dangerous. You don't want your back on no staircase oh, when no. all that's going on. That it looks romantic. It just it makes no sense. Leslie Bibb went from like I hate this man, get out my house, to let's make another child. <laughs> that's it. Hey, listen, you, you gonna tell Vigo Mortensen now? Oh, I'm not gonna tell Vigo Mortenstein nothing. Nothing. Uh, let's get into full spoiler territories. We'll go through the plot and talk about uh, what we like, what we don't, uh, and laugh about everything in between. But our film opens up with our intro to the losers. We get Rogue. Is it Rogue? It's Rogue, Rogue right? Rogue with a Q. 
Roke. Roke. I, I okay. pronounce it I like Roke. 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 Nice. You put your uh, pinky up. Sounds like a 2020 hip hop artist. Yes. It yeah. does. Or a mid 90s uh, like spoken word <laughs> group. <laughs> oh, God. Like Hanson. Roke. I mean, Roke. Roke is a pretty good name, but I, I like Pooch. Pooch is a pretty good name there, too. That's Columbus it, it's Shorts funny because character. In the comic, Pooch is a nickname. Pooch isn't his actual name, but here, that's his first name. His first name is Pooch. His first name is Pooch. <laughs> yeah, you see it on, you see oh, it on his, his dog, dog tags. Tags. Yeah. <laughs> his parents didn't love him. They couldn't have. <laughs> that, you name your dog Pooch. And it's funny. Uh, we, Rook is actually a white, crazy looking white guy in the comics. My man looks yeah. like. That well, name sounds French. Like it would have some kind of French connection to it. Um, he look he looks French. But at least he, at least they kept the scar with Alba. At yeah, the scar is pretty scar. badass. And Alba looks young as hell. I mean, it's been, I mean, oh, it's been a couple years. years, eleven years, right? But yeah, he compared, still looks blood sport compared to rope. That is, yeah. Woo! Yeah. I, I want to say this was during the time of Takers and American Gangster. So he was, and he, he was still pretty known. And he'll be doing Hemdow soon, if not next year, right? He, no he way. Wouldn't he be doing Hemdow the after. same year? I think Thor is Thor 20, uh, 2011. Uh, Thor so was 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I thought it came out the same year as Cap. So both Thor and Cap is 2011. Yeah. And so then, then Hulk, next- I want to say in Iron Man. No, Hulk is Hulk and Iron Man 1 is 2008. Yeah. Yep. Together. Yeah. But my man's looking spry in this. And um, well, also Cougar. And they play blind... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Blind Man's Bluff to pass the time. They're eventually called into action by their leader, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. And we learned that they were sent to Bolivia on a search and destroy mission on a compound run by a drug and arms dealer. Uh, their mission is to aim a laser so they can call an airstrike and blow this whole thing to smithereens. But while doing so, the losers spot slave children on the compound and try to call off their attack. But their supervisor, codename Max, played by Jason Patrick, ignores them and tells them to stick to the mission. What did you guys remember about this scene? What do you guys think about this whole thing of like, yeah, don't even worry about it. We got a mission to do. Fuck these kids. (laughs) Oh, it's a great it's a great introduction to them. I yeah, think it's a great introduction yeah. to the characters. I love a stylized comic book movie. I think James Gunn has finally solidified that if you're a comic book movie, God damn it, be stylized. I love that yeah. every time they went to a new location, it looked like a, a mail stamp on like yeah. a landscape. It, it got me like, thinking like it was that he was watching the Suicide Squad, right? It's like he was watching this. I mean, it's like James Gunn watched, sorry, Losers and was like, huh. <laughs> you can actually do this right if you give somebody with an eye. Like, I'm not going to, like, fault these writers here because these writers went on to write some amazing comic book movies, depending on your taste of it. I love Amazing Spider-Man. And the guy right. that wrote this wrote that. Ah, poor, so, poor, so like, you know, like, poor guy. Yes. Yeah, so, like, <laughs> so there's people <laughs> with resumes here. So, like, like they gave, they gave us a stylized comic book movie, and I will not fault these guys for introducing each character to how they look in the comics with the with that like oversaturated orange and the black like it was awesome yeah. it was one what'd you think about awesome. the what'd you think about the introductory scene dave uh, honestly that was one of the points i wanted to bring up was how they incorporated the comic book transition scenes yeah yeah right into the real life person like it was it was awesome but that intro scene where they're playing blind man's bluff right and roke just pulls out this big ass knife as big <laughs> as my shoe and i'm just yeah. like all right, what's he going to do? And then they start bringing it out. And he brings out another one. And Chris Evans <laughs> yeah. is like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it, you know, we, we were seeing how jovial it is. It literally starts off with a puppet sex show. So I guess oh. we should have started off there. But, oh, baby. But, <laughs> oh, yeah. but eventually, yeah, but eventually. <laughs> um, sex show. That's it. We're here to, you know, to be introduced to them. We see that they're a bit jovial, even though they have a very serious mission. Um, And then, yeah, they get put in this position because their superiors like, you know, stick to the mission. Screw those kids. But unable to kill innocent kids, the losers ignore their commands and save the children before killing the drug lord all within three minutes. Uh, Because that's when the airstrike was called in. As they get ready to evacuate, they load the bird they believed would be taking them home with the children, choosing to send them first. But. The helicopter explodes and the order definitely came from Max. Um, what did you think of all of this here? I mean, did you remember this double cross? I guess is what I should say. Cause I did it. And I was like, wow, this is really early for, for, for all this to go down. Uh, what'd you think, Dave? 
honestly, I the double cross when they first started, when they were up on the hill before they even, you know, as soon as they painted the target. Yeah. Like that whole thing, when that whole exchange kind of irritated me only because I've been in the military. So I know how communications go. Yeah. And so when they're like, this is a secure military channel, like, you know, at, at that point, you just say, <laughs> fuck it. You know, I've yeah. cussed somebody out on the radio before for being an idiot. Like, no, fuck that. What are you talking about? Like, if, if it's life or death, you you interfere. I mean, you, you the, the rules kind of change when it's life or death. You know, when it gets when it gets to a point where. Right. Uh, yeah. You kind of lose a lot of that uh, pomp and circumstance, I guess. I was a bit. Um, I Children are the thing. We were talking about it on the Suicide Squad. That was the line in the entire movie. Right. Killing kids. Right. You know, and that was and, the line right here. Yeah, don't, we don't kill kids. That's how you differentiate a good person from a bad person, seemingly. Right. And um, I, I like that they stole the school bus. Yeah. So <laughs> that part of the exchange right there between Pooch and Jensen was yeah. probably one. Of, it was probably top three favorite moments in that movie because it's like, really? Why not? You think? Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they yeah. didn't even speak the full sentences. Like they yeah, no, knew what perfect they were writing. About. It was just, it was awesome. Yeah, that, they were I, able I, to they, show that this team is an actual team, and exactly that's that. That is what what makes it. It's the chemistry. It's like, and it's funny because this is an imprint of DC. It's almost as if DC was trying to make a Suicide Squad within DC itself. Like just yeah, just make them part of the team. Like you know, make these characters up in DC itself put them in, in Arkham or Bell Reeve and just make them Suicide Squad because that's essentially what they were. Uh, and a lot of these missions were just suicide missions to them. Yeah. But, um, we're also was, in an era where everyone's getting burned, like you're doing burn notice and we're doing, yep. <laughs> you know, a lot of just burning. Everyone's getting burned by their government, apparently. Burning operatives. Uh, it, 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 right. it was that standard, like, turncoat in the beginning and then you got to fight your way back at the end. Like, that, it was that formula for almost half the movies that were getting put out well yeah it was right. the same premise of a team a team was yeah. literally just <laughs> black yeah. forces operatives that got burnt by like a military government higher up only they yep. got put in jail and they broke out of jail to clear their name these guys pre uh, presumed dead to clear their name that comes out the year after this right 18 i'm pretty sure 18 was either 2010 or 11 god either the same year that would have they would have strangled i'm each actually other. I'm, i'd rather look that up just for my own sanity, because I'm pretty sure 18 was 2010. Uh, go ahead. Dude, 18 uh, was 2010. Wow. So, yeah, this with, had not a chance. With like, a budget of 100 to 110 million. Golly. So, quadruple the budget. Uh, names, not, oh, well, some acting names that people knew, but definitely the IP people knew way more about the 18 than they did about the losers. Oh, you, yeah. can, you can see them taking that and running with it, taking all that money and stuff. Um, Gosh, so this you know what you know what's real funny about this movie? I didn't even know this movie existed until I was looking up stuff while I was while I was overseas and I was like, all right, what Marvel movie came out while I was there? Yeah. So yeah. what can I download? What can I rip real quick so I can watch that and have something entertaining? And then I was like, oh cool, Chris Evans is gonna be Captain America. Let me go down the rabbit hole. And I saw he was in the losers. I'm like, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. And I was literally sitting there in my bunk and I'm like, okay, I've never heard of this movie, never saw a trailer. I'm going to download it. Download it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it, it's definitely a sneak hit. Um, and Max snuck that hit on the losers because they were managed to stay away. Uh, but they're looking at the wreckage and they realize that they were the intended target. The government declares them dead. They are also, you know, they also fake their own deaths. And with no way home, the losers are stuck in Bolivia. So they make themselves at home. Um, up until this point, did you guys have a favorite loser? Up to this point, my favorite loser was probably Jensen because yeah. he just he just eats the scenery. And, you know, it's funny is when I started this book, this book doesn't this book is does, is totally complicated more than the movie. The movie sticks to like a general like, you know, like a linear narrative. This book hops okay. all over the place. The book actually starts off with um, them stealing the giant helicopter from the military. Would you say that um, Clay is the main character of that book? He is, but he's also a lot more. He he has a lot of qualities with Billy Butcher. Like he's I mean, I thought the style. I thought the I thought the outfit kind of gave me a lot of Billy Butcher vibes. Uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was Billy Butcher in the universe or something. There's this panel where where um they're on a boat and they're mm -hmm. like going they're they're going to like their next mission and you see Jensen in the back fishing 
And he's like, <laughs> he's catching a swordfish. Like he literally has a swordfish in the air as he pulls out the ocean. And you see right. Billy Butcher just not Billy. You see, you see <laughs> Clay just gun down this swordfish with oh. <laughs> <laughs> just so he couldn't have it. But bro, it's like what you wanted it dead, right? That's literally what he tells him. He looks him like what you wanted it dead, and you just see yeah. the panel. The panels like the background is all red with like a silhouette swordfish with like giant holes in it because he's just yeah. down with two Uzis in his hands. Oh, I'm that's so, hilarious. I need I need a reboot with the same actors, and I need this to be rated R because that's what I need. No, in this I movie. was saying the exact same thing. It's like, yo, I need this reboot because yo, where's James Gunn at? Let's let's get a reboot. Because be this, down. this book is so heavy. There's so much, and there's so much stuff that they could have added in this in this movie. Where, where yeah. they really only added like maybe three, four locations from 12 issues that they were basing it on. They I went feel to- like the genre in general, people have, were just very careful about what they adapted and what they didn't. Like they, everyone was picking and choosing at the buffet as opposed to just ordering the meal that was the book back in the day, right? They would be like, eh, I don't want that. And that seems problematic. And I don't think we can do that in CGI. So we're just going to take what we can from this. And yeah, it reminds me of, of that. So yeah, crazy. Like that scene, that, that scene in Miami where they steal the armored car in the mm-hmm. book. They do that on the Verrazano. Ah, they couldn't film that on the Verrazano they in New York. Though. Doing that on the Verrazano, and in, in the book, you actually know that there's a SWAT team in there, like because you get it from their POV. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a lot that could have been. I just think there was so much that if you take take this into a TV show. Like a nice twelve episode season oneer, or yeah. the, do the first two volumes in two seasons. This would this show would kill. This show would kill. Make I can see a situation happen. where they would have, a, a, I guess a a less restrained director would have, like flashback to every character, right? And then like how they get in the team and how you know how they try to let yep. the oh, those are- out. There would be a flashback for everyone, even though I think that they do a good job of just getting information across by just saying it half the time. You know, they just say it. They just say what their relations are to each other, who has kids, who doesn't, etc. The book on the same boat scene that I'm talking about, you have like Pooch and Cougar. And they're basically talking about what they would do if they were done once they're like fully done with missions forever. And they're both just basically saying, you know, I just want peace. Like Pooch doesn't have a wife and kid in the book. He talks about wanting a wife and kid in the book. Hmm. I wonder why they gave him one here. Yeah, I guess they wanted to tether somebody who are, actually had stakes at home. Jensen doesn't have a niece in the book. Yeah, you see, you gotta get, you gotta give him something to to fight for, though. You know, those it, petunias. Had nothing to fight for other than wanting to clear their name. The petunias are doing good this season, so he's trying to get back <laughs> for that for that game. Well, you know? it was that draft. They really succeeded off of that draft. You know, gotta get gotta get the the high dollar players right there. I will, I will bring this one point up before we move on. Um, Go ahead, bro. You know, in a lot of movies like this where you have, like, the government turns on your people and then they got to fight their way back, that usually happens, like, halfway through the movie because you get some backstory in the beginning and you get, like, you know, a couple of missions and then you get the mission where they get turned on. Right. This happened in the first 10 minutes. Like, right. Like, the whole movie, they're fugitives. Exactly. And, and that's they're... one thing I loved about this. They took that formula and they're like, all right, Fuck this first two thirds. We're doing this. No, yeah, because they essentially start the book off as fugitives. They're robbing from the United States military at the U.S. Mexico border. Oh, like, they do a, back, they do off, a flashback. They're, they're already bad. Huh. So they do they do a flashback and talk about that Max stuff. Yeah. It, okay. It, what it is is it's really more like breadcrumb throughout. Okay. Like you get bits and pieces of what the hell is going on? What's going on? What's going on? But. Other than that, yeah, you jump right into the action. Open the book. First thing you see is that the military hijacking. You had mentioned this, you know, you said it, it reminded you a lot of reading the boys. And that kind of happened with Billy Butcher as well, where we start the story already with him hating soups. And then they sprinkle in kind of the reasons why and his experience with them uh, as you continue to read forward. But and that's yeah, it's interesting. Needed as a TV show. And if they would have done the boys as a movie, it, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> too much story to tell it's a lot of world building that they did you know um and you can't do all that in a film they, people don't got patience anymore for that if it wasn't good on the first try they wouldn't have went for a sequel 
Uh, so yeah, it, it's <laughs> rough all around. Thirty six issues to this entire run, and they they managed to take twelve compact issues and turn it into an hour and thirty minutes. And that's what kind of frustrates me. It's like there was so much they could. So there is legit so much world building in these books. Yeah. Well, that was the other thing with this movie. They were banking on it doing well and having, uh, I think they were trying to make it into a trilogy. They were. But it it bombed at the box office. Because they all went to go see the A-Team. That's what, that's what happened. Yeah, because yeah, those were the two killed movies it. of the summer. Marvel killed it. Yeah, it went absolutely crazy. DC um, does not have a history of doing good with movies at the box office. Not at all. Because DC sometimes is just laser focused on beating Marvel in some kind of weird revenge plot. And seemingly they're not the only ones because Clay has been hell bent this entire time since they've been burned to get Max. And uh, it's not getting Rook or Rook too happy because he's like, I just want to go home and you want to kill Max. Can we just go home? Can we figure out a way to go home? But um, he's yeah, he's hell bent. He felt like he left. He let his teammates down and he killed seemingly a bunch of kids. Um, obviously he wasn't the one who did it, but all that's weighing heavy on him. So he does what you do in Bolivia. He goes to go get something to drink and is ends up being seduced by a woman, uh, Zoe Saldana, who asks him if they can go get more relaxed, um, easily seduced because I think most people just succumb to the word poppy. I think if any beautiful woman were to come to me and just be like, <laughs> Hey poppy, I'm like, yeah, well, wait, what? Uh, my debit card number is so, you know, and so it's Zoe saw that. I don't know, man. My hand will be on top of my drink the entire night. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you, what you trust B this woman. Do. I heard what Cardi B used to do. Hey, it happens. It happens B. Put, put the little on. party pill in your scotch. Next thing you know, you're waking up in a bathtub full of ice with a missing kidney. And nobody needs that. You have, you have two. You have two oh, Bolivian kidneys, <laughs> the Bolivian black market. You can find your kidney out there. Yep. <laughs> uh, he he takes her back to his room and she admits to be following him. Uh, suddenly she pulls a gun out on him and the two fight before she proposes a deal. She can help him find Max and get his men back to the States so long as they kill Max for her. Uh, did you guys find any of this stuff fishy? I was just confused because she pulls a gun out on Clay. If she would have shot him there, would that have been the end of all this? Like if she would have just shot him in the face in, in so, this hotel room. This whole this whole bit leading up to where we're at now, like that exchange between Roke and Clay was so emotional. And you could tell for Roke, he was like, you know, if you're not losing them, you're losing me. Yeah. Like, yeah. just get us home. Yeah. And, you know, he's like, I'm not a captain. We're not soldiers anymore. Like, it was just that so defeating. Like, I just want to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. Like, we're done. Right. But then he goes into the bar and he's sitting there eating the steak and one line like that exchange at the bar where she was like how's your steak and he's like meaty yeah like, you know, he was like <laughs> following me like right 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 what? yeah <laughs> and they get to the hotel room that fight scene that fight scene was like you they both knew they were gonna fight because she goes in the bathroom to freshen up quote and unquote they're, they're both stretching and they're stretching <laughs> and he's out there cracking his back ready to go Dude, when he slammed her up against the wall, I thought he was going to put her through it. Yeah, yeah. And they weren't um, putting their punches either. They were doing all... Ooh. I mean, they, it got to the point where they both were very close to killing one another before they decided... Well, uh, you saw when he, like, turned and backhanded her and she went down? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> At one point when he pushes up against the wall, he just starts punching her in the ribs. I'm like, oh, my nope. God. <laughs> like, There's oh comic book God. movies and comic book shows love to have the intimate fight scenes. For some yeah. reason, their their men and women characters have to like have to have some sort of intimate fight in close quarters combat. Like, if the guy's not throwing the girl up against the wall and vice versa, they're definitely not having any kind of romantic chemistry. I guess people you, just fight when they really like each other. You know, I had to look it up. Yeah, they tell that's what they tell girls on the playground, right? That he yeah, pushed you down because he likes, likes you. He likes you. But you know what? I had to look up. Uh, five years prior to this film was Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Which is, you know, what people that look at when they it. think of well, yeah, when they think of a woman and a man sex fighting, I guess. No, that's <laughs> what we're going to call it. the birth of it. Because you have Mr. and Mrs. Smith <laughs> not too long after. Hell, you know, I even think just because it's so unknown, I would go ballistic X versus Sever. Ah, I bet y'all don't know. Do they do that in that? that? Lucy Lou and Antonio Banderas. That title just confused me. So I I, I was like, did I? X no, versus X, Sever. I, yeah, like, I don't know who X and Sever are. So why is the verses X, in the title? I think X was... E E C K S X. I think that was Lucy Liu and Sever was Antonio Banderas. 
They should have just came Mr. And Mrs. Smith before Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Do you like this couple? Do you like or the perceived couple of uh, Clay and who you learn to be Aisha later on? Do you I'm think that really they look good fan. together? I'm not really a fan only because the comics, it's one, her introduction in the comics is freaking amazing. She infiltrated uh-huh. a um, human, uh, a, like a Muslim human trafficking warehouse. Mm-hmm. So right. like, she, she like liberates a bunch of women from like, I don't know, I think they're like from like Persia or, or Pakistan. Right. But, she ba- that's basically her introduction and then she's just already jumped into giving intel to clay without clay knowing who she is okay so there's like a, a lot secret. of talk like can we trust this woman i don't know if we can trust this woman like who is this woman and stuff like that right but once right. again like i'm saying <laughs> basically the everything that happens in that last act of this movie happens in the second and third comic of this run Oh, wow. So we're just hitting the, t- the iceberg. The, in this. the second issue ends with Jensen in the in, in that um office building stopped by the two security guards. That's how the second uh, issue ends. Wow. So they sped right through all of Be- this. And but there was but once you get past basically all the scenes from the movie, there's a whole other adventure like they like they take the whole Goliath, uh, that little uh, tr- money transfer thing. And they yeah. go with it for like three issues. I mean, I seemingly they were going to be the big bad or, you know, it's one of the tech companies because Max got away and they seemingly had a breadcrumb trail uh, with him. They were look like they were setting something up for this. But like we said, again, the money just wasn't there for them, uh, which kind of sucked. Uh, what I liked about this, though, especially that scene there, the sex fight scene is, again, now that I'm watching so many of these films and I'm trying to dissect them in my head, I, I look at that scene as... Um, you know, a, a scene to prove how formidable this woman is in not only intelligence, because she tracked down a colonel, basically, seemingly followed down a colonel uh, to the point that there were even places she was watching him from that he didn't even know about um, and then takes it to him, you know, basically in, in a fight scene, doesn't pull her punches that way. We had to do a short run of why we should know that she's just as badass as everybody. And I think they did a good job in, in the short amount of time that they did. And uh, they, they book end later that song that they were fighting to when they are actually making love later on. So I don't know, if, you know, what that was supposed to evoke, but uh, you know, there's some kind of artsy something there, right? There's some kind, kind, of- kind of. So they do that a lot in some films. Like they'll have one version of the song during the fight scene, but then they'll have like a remixed covered version of that song. Yeah. In like a more intimate moment. Right. Right. <laughs> And um, you, I guess you are supposed to pull from that. Like it, it's all a dance to them, whether it's fighting or it's making love. Uh, they're skilled at both. And so it all becomes kind of operatic after a while. It's like showing, Absolutely. Off, your, showing off your dance moves and stuff. Um, Clay believes her. So he arranges a, a loser's reunion to meet this mysterious and wanted woman named Aisha, who tells them that they can get to Max while he's in Miami. And although he'll be armed to the teeth, she will fund and equip them so they can be successful. We, we get some time with Max as he uh, murders one of his less enthusiastic partners, throwing, um, he, he gives his, his right hand man a nod, and that man throws him. 57 floors off of a building good old um, holding callan man that that's the, that's a david fincher classic right there man my man has been like every david fincher anything from fight club to zodiac to mine hunters i couldn't help but think when he threw him off, when he says like oh you'd have to throw him off 57 floors i thought right to the scene in pulp fiction where they're talking about that guy getting thrown. you gotta throw a man <laughs> off the roof fucking up the way he, said, he walks yeah he's like uh uh, he fell a couple stories. They had a, uh, they had a, one of those little greenhouses, you know, where you keep planting shit. Motherfucker fell through that. <laughs> I, think, I was thinking of all that there. Um, but yeah, he orders one of the alive men now to give him four snooks. I'm like, what the fuck is a snook? We'll find out later. <laughs> um, and yeah, they, a they snook is a very popular 90s video game that I used to play all the time. It sounds like one of those Snoop Dogg isms. Like like a snook, a snook, <laughs> yeah, it's a snoop dog nuke. Me, yeah, there you go, snoop dog. It plays sexual seduction as it comes oh, over. That's and that's drop the whole it like lie. it's hot every time it comes down to blow things up. I kind of, I would commission that. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to hear it like a? That's too on the nose, before? though. Dropping a nuke on someone while playing "Drop It Like It's Hot." Yeah, that's true. That's true. You could do it during one of like the Pharrell parts or something. <laughs> but 
but y- using caskets to smuggle them into the Mex US border. Again, I feel like a movie going for runtime would have planned this whole heist out, this whole part with the caskets. You know, there would have been a whole uh, war room scene where they're like, and then you and you and you. Well, I'm going to pause you real quick. One thing I remember about originally watching this movie is for some reason, I remember there being like a minute of them like prepping the caskets and them getting in and then them getting put on the plane or the boat or whatever. Huh. I'm not going to lie. I'm with you on that one. I'm maybe we were, we're suffering from the mandala effect, but I could have sworn I remember a, a preparation scene. If not, if anything, just them getting in the casket. Exactly. Like when I watched that, cause I watched it twice this weekend. I watched it Saturday cause I didn't have anything else going on. And then I watched Dang. it Sunday to be prepared for this. And I was like, where is that fucking scene? Because I swear <laughs> to God, I remember it. And it maybe wasn't there. You ripped the torrent. You probably got a deleted there, scene. Like... No, I'm wondering if maybe we saw some sort of extended cut or something. Because, yeah, this is the one I, that I saw for Netflix. Are we going to get a three-hour director's cut of this on HBO Max soon? That's what we need. With everybody with gray hairs now, you know, taking their arthritis <laughs> medication <laughs> and killing it. I'm down. Idris Elba comes back for reshoots, and he's just looking old and scruffy. Release Still the Peter Bird the cut. Butt. And he's still rocking the blood sport costume because he's like, listen, don't even worry about it. No one's going to ask any questions. Um, but yeah, they do this slow motion walk that's become kind of cliche at this point, but it looks oh, badass. Every CIA moment <laughs> ever. Yeah, but you They're know what? All... Think of it. Four out of six of the men on that, of the people on that team have all done now a slow motion superhero walk <laughs> for major yeah, companies. Right? <laughs> yeah. They, so they were, this is the training wheels. That's what you were saying. Essentially. Yeah, they're getting ready for it. Um, so, yeah, they get ready to take Max down. And me- meanwhile, Max tests one of these snooks, which turned out to be an eco-friendly sonic bomb with the potency of a nuclear warhead. It's a sonic uses- dematerializer. Yes. So it uses sonic fields to crush surrounding environments into oblivion. The biggest benefit of it is there's no pollution. <laughs> so in case you want to kill off a bunch of innocents, but still want to make sure that you don't have to, you know, global warming is not that big of an issue. This because is the way to go. Something I've noticed about crazy, psychotic, you know, um, global domination people is they don't want to destroy the world because they want to live. They just want to yeah. kill off humans and be alone. So yeah. I, it's not like I can't say I don't support <laughs> villains like that <laughs> like you know like i want to live here i want to be alive on this healthy planet and you know yeah. enjoy the nature like uh, last night i found myself in a rabbit hole of of the wonders of the world that no longer exist the capital of mexico city how gorgeous it the paintings made it look in the 1500s now it's all industrialized and there's a highway behind it and i'm crying yeah. it's like damn it we destroyed the world I mean, we destroyed the Justice League. We've seen that film. Oh, we just God. are terrible no, people. We didn't destroy the <laughs> Justice League. <laughs> just like Kathleen Kennedy destroyed Star Wars. There you go. We got to get rid of her. No, I'm joking. But yeah, like the, he's, he's kind of like hyped that he's going to be like a green terrorist, which was, which was pretty interesting and, and would work a lot better now. Um, and speaking of which, it, this has an undertone of, of people in high up military positions using false flags to incite wars to then profit off of you know the military industrial complex it was a hot button topic at the time i don't know if they're doing the many movies about it now but they were doing them all willy-nilly around this time period as well so it makes a lot of sense that they were doing it here um he aims to sell these nukes he doesn't want to use them he's going to sell them to the highest bidder but the bidder has to promise to use them he doesn't want people just stockpiling these things because he wants someone to create a terrorist attack that he can then use to make a lot of money off of it. Um, and he is there talking with his boy, Wade, and the parasail holder uh, kind of misses her mark for a bit. And he is touched by some rays of sunshine. She apologizes, adjusts herself, and he shoots her. I have no idea what this was supposed to signify, I guess. Bro, yeah. listen. This is villain 101. In every villain introduction of all time, someone has to die. Someone has to be killed to show how you don't want to piss this person off. And almost, if you you could think about it. It wasn't even his first villain introduction because his first villain introduction, he's like, well, why'd you throw this guy off the roof? Like, you know, he was a smart guy. We kind of needed him. Sure. I think in that moment, I think in that moment, you're led to believe that 
he didn't want to get that guy killed. So maybe he does care about people. And then this parasol moments like, oh no, he probably would have killed that man later on anyway. <laughs> like, you know what I'm like just well, showing his, he does say disregard. that. Well, it, it, it showed, it had an effect. So throw the other guy off the roof, but like, yeah, right. Yeah. It, 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 I guess, I guess if you're a truly psychotic, there is no line of who lives and who dies. It's really more of a flip of a coin in your head. Yeah. Like, yeah. like in that moment, you don't need to die in this moment. I, I rather you die. Like, yeah. And that, you know, it's funny. I knew this scene was coming too. And I remembered, I'm like, oh God, he's going to kill this girl. He's going to gun this beautiful girl down in this nice purple blouse. Like, damn it. Why the beautiful ones? Yeah. He's, he's hella uh, charismatic and he doesn't talk always professionally, which I guess is also kind of ingratiates himself to us because he's, sorry, he talks like a regular guy like a regular dude he's not always mustache twirling about the betterment of mankind or anything like that he just is like yeah i'm just gonna buy this sell it to these people and make a lot of money um which was really really funny what i was interested in is we end up going back to with the losers to new mexico and we find out that they have this plan to steal a medevac chopper so jensen and rogue uh, Roke <laughs> pretend to be soldiers to steal this chopper. Um, they're able to, and then they attach the chopper's GPS to a rocket and s- shoot it and then repaint the helicopter. I don't know if any of this would work. I see Dave's already holding his head. But the first thing initially that I thought as, as a former service member was as soon as the medevac showed up and saw that there was facial hair on both of uh, the men that they were saving, I think they would have realized that it was all a trick because not only would you not, uh, do they not allow Jensen's facial hair, but that, that was a lot like that. All the whole thing was a lot. The hair so, was a lot. <laughs> what do you say, Dave? That, that whole scene tripped me out because <laughs> one, you're in fucking New Mexico. What, why are you like, first off, why? Yeah. Why yeah. in New Mexico are we crashing a Humvee like into a truck? A, nine uh, times out of ten, you're not taking a vehicle off base. Yeah, and if you are, you're not calling a medevac if you get hurt because you have regular people there. No, you're in a you. you're in the civilian war. You're calling fucking AAA. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> like, percent. The ambulance and they would just come, but yeah, they they are able to take this. A whole bunch of people get tranked. There's a lot of tranking going on in this film, also. What's um, funny is like in the book, it's like they're not just on a regular highway. They're in New Mexico, but they're not on a highway. They're in a missile range training place. Like they're oh, okay. jack, they're jacking Humvees and stuff like that, and a helicopter at a missiles training base. Okay, so if they're at a training site in the comic, that makes more sense. Yeah, it's just be like riding on the road. And sh- yeah, we don't. You don't usually take those vehicles and ride on the road with them. And if we were to get into some kind of mishap. We wouldn't call our specific emergency medical team because odds are other people had to get tended to, too. What about the guy in the truck? You know, we're just going to airlift the soldiers and then and not only that, but like they're going to airlift them without checking anything without seeing anything. Again, I would have seen their face here and been like, I don't think these guys are military. That guy has blunt frosted tips. I don't think he's in the military. They do that with so many military types in movies. Like, I mean, you watch if you watch The Hurt Locker. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anthony, I think it was, what was it? Anthony Mackey was in that. Yeah. Yeah. And he, didn't he have a goatee going on? Like, uh, yeah, I want to say he did. Yeah. And they just chalked it up to them being where they're at, but no, you got to show Right. That shit. But I mean, I don't know. You don't have, if you have facial hair, it sure as shit ain't styled. Yeah. 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 But that exchange between Roke and Jensen while they're laying there waiting is yeah. one of the funniest moments in that whole movie. Like you're dead. Dead guy can't say shit. Yeah, he's really good at needling people. Uh, Chris Evans and Jensen in this film. He's really good at getting underneath people's skin. He has that jovial nature, like I said. And and maybe it's just because I've been flooded with the man recently, but it reminds me of how Ryan Reynolds can kind of just poke and poke and poke at somebody. There's probably other uh, better examples, but that's what I think of. But also the whole thing was it wasn't Jensen that was stopping the people in the comic. It's it is on it's clay, full clean faced clay. But broken with a broke by a broken down. I think he had like a a van. Let me see how, how it looked. Yeah, yeah. They had. They had that like, make more they sense. They had like a they had like a a giant eighteen wheeler, and they were broken right. down while like a Humvee was driving by. Ah, uh, yeah that that makes a ton more sense. I did like that. J- uh, Jensen was getting on his own case for overacting. It's like ah oh, man, I shouldn't have. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, he has kids. So people have kids. It is what it is. <laughs> talking to himself. That was really, really funny. And then Homegirl runs up and he's like, oh my God. Yeah, he's hitting on her. He's like, you're going to hit on her? You don't got any legs? <laughs> he's like, you got no legs, bro. How are you hitting on her? <laughs> got out of date. Um, but yeah, then they shoot the GPS. I don't know how that works. Eventually it would land, I'm assuming. Like, I would figure there'd be other tracking systems on the helicopter. You can't just lose a bird like that. <laughs> I do like how in that moment they had a callback to the beginning of the movie where he's like, what's up with this? Like, don't call me Colonel bullshit. Like what, yeah. what's going on? And then he explains, he's like the classic loss of identity. Like clay, you know, that was, that was him. He was a Colonel, a special forces Colonel in the military. Like that was him. And now that's gone. So it's, you know, wh- who am I? Right. And he can use it to justify some of the more great things that have happened yep. but without that title then you you have to take on all that accountability yourself. And seemingly the last thing that he was the colonel in charge of got 25 innocent children killed and the, his men cannot go back home. So he doesn't want to be the one to call the next to make the next bad call. And um, cats only make a thousand sounds while dogs make 10. <laughs> that's true. So you can't trust that's, cats. Don't trust no damn Not cats. to be trusted. Not to be trusted. He's right. He's he's one hundred percent right on that. I also think it's funny. Like now with with this movie, now going back and watching Winter Soldier and all the double triple crosses and stuff, <laughs> it just makes me <laughs> laugh because like he was just on the cusp of all that way early. Um, but yeah, they like I said, they shoot the rocket uh, GPS stuff. Roke demands answers from Aisha. Rocket made out of PVC pipe. Yeah, and again. It would have to land eventually. It's not like these things just shoot forever. <laughs> they they would land, and I don't know. There's a lot going on here. The people would wake up in and call. The book. She wasn't even here for this. You don't even see her yet. They're the not overseas. Next so scene. Yeah, yeah. She, but I like that. Eventually, Roke is just over the whole shit. He's like, okay, oh, yeah. well, we did <laughs> our part. What the hell is she here for? What's going on with her? And she's like, well, he. Max is trying to get some really dangerous weapons and I need help to stop him. And they're like, okay, cool. Then we'll do that. But then uh, we get to their Miami mission. The next day they follow Max's convoy and Cougar shoots the lead vehicle, stopping the whole convoy. Um, Max's men come out to protect. Oh, and in case you are familiar, the lead vehicle will never be the vehicle with somebody in it worth a damn (laughs) of worth because they understand how these things get attacked. So they're somewhere in the middle. The last vehicle and the front vehicle are, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. So, yeah, they shoot the lead vehicle. It stops the whole convoy. Max's men come out to protect their leader. Um, But then I see a helicopter coming and there's something attached. Now, again, I don't remember a lick from this film. So I'm like, is that a magnet? That's a ma- I'm doing. I'm having the Jesse Pinkman moment in Breaking Bad. I'm like, yes, magnets. <laughs> yeah, magnet, bitch. Yeah, magnet. <laughs> Science, bitch. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they show up in a with a mount with a helicopter mounted magnet and lift what they perceive to be Max's vehicle up and into the sky. Uh, they reconvene and realize that an old friend is named Wade is working with Max, and they open Max's vehicle, but he isn't inside. Instead, instead, there's a hard drive. And this is the first hard drive that looked like a hard drive. That actually looked like a, just a uh, uh, Western digital <laughs> plug inside <laughs> kind of hard drive. Usually, it's just some kind of like weird, it looks like a weird computer chip, and you got to do something with it. But this is definitely in the era of just sticking thumbsticks in computers and taking all the information and stuff. So that makes Don't a lot of sense. Don't forget randomly tapping the keyboard, and I'm in. I like Or, I or sticking I a like- thumbstick in. <laughs> Sticking a thumbstick in and just every window that can pop up does pop up. It just boop, 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 boop. Oh, How do you wait, just, just install a Trojan virus? Like, what's going on here? How I'm do you figure? You just need the algorithm. Let me just let me just put in the algorithm <laughs> real quick to break the password, get through the <laughs> firewall. No, bro, you got to look around. Look for the book titles. You understand? His favorite book title or the name of his wife, which is going to be some I was picture old, on the desk. You know, I was love all Maggie. of that the day I saw Split. And the day I watched Anna Taylor Joy do the same thing on this man's laptop and get every file diary of every personality he had. Like, I am done with this tapping at a keyboard computer and getting everything you need in two seconds. Hacking- I got off that bus a bit earlier than you, my friend. I got off that bus when fucking Batgirl in Batman Forever breaks oh. into the fucking oh. Batcave. She's like, England? <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to figure out 
<laughs> yeah, he's trying to find out his thing, and he like finds out like it's his sister or his wife or something like no, that. No, it's his. It's it. her. It's it's her character's name is the pa- mother. I think it was the mother though, because the mother, his sister, was her mother. And I think there was a picture next to the laptop. Or, no, they didn't have laptops next to the big ass uh, desktop that was there. But again, and then she goes in and he pre-programs uh, like welcome sequence for her where he opens everything in the back. <laughs> Barbara, <laughs> then you should know that blah, blah, blah. Here's all the top secret vehicles and weapons that we have. At our disposal. Here's Batman's secret identity in case I can trust you because you're my estranged niece I haven't seen in years. Who's been in England but still has a very sharp American accent? Like I said, I was all the way to America in the summer wearing her schoolgirl outfit. (laughs) That's true. Like change. We got we got to cover that movie one one of these days by itself because that movie is yeah it is a lot it is a lot. Um, Yeah, they find out it's just a hard drive. The group argues because obviously Aisha knew it about it and she kind of confirms with a look and. This is another layer of Roke getting back in Clay's face and being like, bro, then we need to just stop this again because we're back at another revenge mission. I'm done with this revenge mission bullshit. We could have got killed out there in Miami and it was all for nothing. We got an F-bomb in a comic book movie. Hey, was this? You made a deal. No, fuck deals. You made a deal (laughs) with Clay. I didn't make a deal. I actually liked that line, even though it was kind of, um, it could have splintered the group. Right, because you either going to be Team Clay in that moment or Team Rook, uh, or Oak. But it, it's true; it's a hundred percent true. Y'all yeah, were in some kind of weird, you know, room in a hotel in Bolivia making this deal. Y'all don't want to tell me nothing, and then you just want me to risk my life. You got to give me a little bit something here. So he's always kind of been antsy about all of this because they 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 talk about Max, they talk about the money, they talk about the bombs, they talk about the convoy. No one talks about coming home. <laughs> No one's yeah. talking about we're just here to come home, and he's kind of over it in that instance. Which I don't blame him one bit because, like, he, I mean, if you think about it, she gave him the runaround twice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just because she's cute. And prior to this, when they are setting up to meet her at the cemetery, they allude to the fact that maybe Clay has a weakness for women because it's happened before where his judgment kind of gets askew and then they're left out because of it. Uh, so there was a little bit of a uh, distrust there already. I do like, so we talked early on, I'll say this quick. We talked early on about how quickly they do the Max betrayal. And I think it's to it's so that we're off the set of the eventual Roke betrayal. Because uh, we do eventually get an uh, Aisha betrayal. But I think the big hook of this, the big reveal would eventually be about what happened with Rook. And they layer, there's a breadcrumb trail that leads to that betrayal it doesn't feel like it came out of left field where when we're watching the film in the beginning we don't know why max just randomly fucking burned all these guys and killed all those kids so i really like that they were setting up for these betrayals early on and if you watch back with the knowledge of who betrays who why it all lines up in my opinion bro this betrayal happened in uh, issue three uh max's or rokes rokes Oh, wow. Rokes betrayal literally that caps off issue three and issue four starts with the guys being lined up in front of those storage facilities and Aisha on top of the thing with the bazooka so flowing. Is she a, is she a, uh, the daughter of that guy or no in the comments? We, we don't know who she is yet, but all of that stuff with Clay and getting to the bottom of her backstory is still happening. Oh, okay. There's okay. still all, so. all of these betrayals and twists and plots that happen in this movie so early. Some of them don't happen yet. Because it's okay. The movie is based on two volumes. Yeah, like I said, they pick and choose uh, what they want to do. Yeah, so like they, they they hold on some things and then throw some things away with no problem. Like, like Rogue's betrayal happens issue three, but you oh, still okay. don't know why Aisha is working with Clay and what sh- and she knows something. Right, there's, she's there's not letting on. Like, like they they have a deal together, and all you know is Aisha helping clay on his part of the deal you don't know what her part of the deal is yet yeah yeah huh um back to max he's like at the set of goldeneye for some reason (laughs) he's at this big satellite (laughs) he's he's on the set of goldeneye this big satellite facility uh and he gets on wade's case because he's like who the hell stole the drive and to make a cable guy reference bro but i literally (laughs) think it's the same 
I literally think it's the same set from GoldenEye, though. I don't think there's many of these big satellite things in the world. I think it's literally, they were like, is that still up? We're going to go over. I love how this man is just being a dick to Wade for no reason. Wade's just like, so what you working on? He's like, do you understand particle physics? I mean, he's do not being understand? a dick. He just, he got his drive stolen. He's tight away because he's like, you were the one leading the mission and the drive's gone. What's going on, bro? So funny, you know, when that, when that all goes down, that's why they call Wade. With, oh, okay, so he's the he's the, he's part the of that whole uh, the the giant magnet thing. The giant magnet right. crap happens with in, on the Verrazano in the comics, and then they call in Wade because they're like, "Oh yeah, no, we we need we need some big do- some big guns." Uh, so Wade's the big sense. guns they call when they kept getting screwed over by the losers. Yeah, I felt like he was gonna have a much bigger arc in this. The way they like would yeah, say his so name, and everyone's like, "Wade, oh Wade," in the book. And I'm like, oh, well, he's just you know, what we didn't even talk about though is mm. how Pooch got made. Yeah, he says yeah. that. He's up through the fucking bottom of the helicopter. No, and he says that. He says, oh, we're made. It's screw, screw, oh, he, he like stands on top of like the Humvee with the gun on it and looks through binoculars. And like, you're not going to see through all that shit. It's going to be, he's moving. It's already difficult enough to look through binoculars. And, you and you're looking at a moving target. It would also seem like um, Homeboy is a co- the thorough enough villain to like bomb the place and then burn the earth, right? Like I, it, these losers had nothing and managed to get away from Bolivia and live for several months. I figured he would have went th- through there one more time with a fine tooth comb and made sure that all those guys were dealt with. But um, Wade IDs the men who stole the drive as the same men from the Bolivia situation. And it's Ooh, funny because the comics, it's, it's Aisha that everyone's worried about being the one spotted because she worked for basically this company because it's all under one giant. It, the, whole, the whole book is like the, this, like, um, what's it called? It, it's like a, a, a commentary on socialism and cotton and capitalism. Like the huh. bad guy isn't just the, the CIA. The CIA is protecting big business and big business is good business and Everybody was with the boys too. The oil, the drugs. Yeah, ba- basically, it's like capitalism and conglomerates are really more so the villains, and, and they, the people, pro- the people that profit off of war. Yep, and they just use the military as like their personal bodyguards. Yeah, man, big red, white, and blue attack dog. Remember that? Because that, because <laughs> that's a lot of what they were talking about in the books. Like, oh well, the the military is just after oil, and the oil is really what helps these companies survive thrive so you know good business is what's best for business and this is best for business and i'm like holy crap that there's all there's a a short little story called goliath part one to four and it's Mm -hmm. literally all about this money drive and this thumb drive yeah so many of these wars are started with nationalistic uh goals or you know uh, ideas but the only flag and color that really matters is green we've seen some of the worst of bedfellows come together just for money reasons you, you know? kept saying best for business does that really mean vince mcmahon's a, a real real life <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he, he is far more that he's lex luther just not as smart he's like does a that make, lex luther does that make AEW the losers in this in this scenario to me tony khan is ozymandias having a conversation with lex luther it's like well if if you're the smartest guy in your world and you failed well, there then I guess. guess. You, you Speaking of which, clock. Dr. Manhattan would have just came in here and just wiped all this away. If, the, if he was in his <laughs> snow, he would have just showed up with his big blue penis and just went like that. And everybody well, would have been. Dr. Manhattan away. is Jim Cornette and he's just disassociated. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. He's like, I'm, it all. I'm tired of these people. I'm tired of being caught in the tangles of their lives. I can see it. I can totally see it. Uh, so, wait. Uh, we were at mom. Nope. We are at the snooks. We're back at the snooks. Yeah, we're um, in the golden eye setting. Yes. So he is tight. He calls for an eight, 18 man fire team and he needs them in 12 hours. Uh, in case he tells you don't understand, he needed he needs a man fire team in 12 hours. Right. And in about 12 hours, he would need Wade to get him an 18 man fire team. <laughs> uh, so that's not her name. I put in Houston Alicia. That's not her name. Aisha shares a drink and a night with Clay. And he gets his balls bust about it afterwards, um, as he should. Like, this was all very weird. When she came back in with the bottle, I was like, wait a minute. Did we not just establish that she's not to be trusted? What's going on here? But I again, half expected, like, an Adele song 
to be playing, yeah. especially since 2010. I was expecting like some rolling in the deep or something. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I loved I loved the, you know, classy uh, you know, just woman riding on a man uh love making that they used. Well, to the there was also a callback when she when she came in, she had the same bottle she threw against the wall. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like whiskey. Yeah, I think and, it uh, looked like Johnny Walker Black. Yeah. And she knew that I was going to black him out. So they, they I, and she put it on him. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what it is with, when movies do like these soft core sex scenes. Why girls always have to like throw their heads to the ride. side to the side. They just while ri- ride. writhe on a man. After and, and, their bra. To, your, to your point earlier about how she's not to be trusted. In fairness, it's Zoe Saldana. I don't care That's if she's to saying. be trusted or not. I mean, let's go. It, <laughs> is, yeah, she, it is Zoe Saldana. And this was Zoe Saldana before she was even at the height. Of her yes. career, what, this 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 was all she really had under her name was what what uh the remake to Death at a Funeral. <laughs> That's really I believe it. so. Yeah, this was what three or four years prior to Guardians of the Galaxy. Like she this she was wasn't four years before Guardians. This was yeah. a year removed Damn. from Avatar. But even That's then, she still only she was covered in blue through all yeah, of you Avatar. Didn't see her. Yeah, you would have to look up who Zoe Saldana was. I think this was probably a, even a year before Columbiana. Before it she sucks. really got I, I was gonna mention that. I was gonna mention that because like she kills it in this, and I guess they they attempted to make her her own, you know, film or franchise with Colombiana, but I heard many people did not like that film. And which Colombiana sucks. confused the hell out of me because Colombiana literally comes out a year after the losers, and I thought this was like a spin-off sequel <laughs> or like a that spin-off been hilarious. Sequel. So I swear for ye- for years until someone told me no. For years, I would go around saying, "Oh, did you ever see the Colombian that the Losers prequel, the the little uh, Zoe Saldana prequel that she right, had?" Right, right, right. Because I always thought it was a comic book property. Nope, that was just straight Luc Besant doing his femme fatale style as usual. We gotta stop trusting these French directors and their female led. <laughs> no, between, uh, between uh, Femme Nikita, the professional, the what? I'm gonna name all of them that he's done. Well, no, what about uh? Element? Uh, that French dude that did Catwoman. I can't. Oh God, with the one Halle Berry Catwoman. Yeah, it's a it's a one word it's a one word name. He's that fancy. He's just a French director with a a one word name. And And he, everyone knew, even he knew what he was doing was shit. And he, they were just having fun doing it anyways. Absolutely, my man. Could you imagine just being so rich that you just one name? Yeah, that's it. That's all I got. That's all I got. What what are you, Madonna? Share. Oh, no, what was the joke in the bad? Wong. One name? What are you, Seal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am McLovin. I am McLovin. So uh, Jensen, while pretending to be a courier, manages to infiltrate the company that made the drive to steal an algorithm that allows him to crack the code. Basically, shot sec- for shot scene. It was great. He was made by security, but uses Cougar and his telekinesis <laughs> abilities to help Loved escape. It. Yeah, it was hilarious. This is a moment that I believe was in trailers. It's on posters. It's one of the moment moments. This was most the most remembered. promotional scene in the, when this movie came out. Yeah, like every trailer that was on TV all showed Chris Evans doing the OK symbol and then that giant panning through the hand through the building. Yes. Yep. Yep. Which I love how um, it's it's literally a shot for shot scene because they even drew it that way in the comics. You get the over the shoulder OK. You get his hand close up, and then you get these three like like it's a going down panel. Like it's not like ah. boxed. It's like going. But like, you have to look down. So like every new panel is that motion. I thought it was interesting to hear him talk about the government experimenting on him. I was getting Steve Rogers vibes there as he's talking about like, <laughs> and it did some things to me, anal things, and I'm like, oh no, Steve. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm oh, pretty no. sure this was also during the time of Push, another yeah. movie where I think. Where they were either they were trying to do their own chronicle slash X Men or these people really experimented on and got superpowers. We're also gonna have to do one day like superhero films that are not based on comic books, like get a Hancock in here, Chronicle, Super stuff like that. Brightburn, uh, Brightburn, Brightburn, Bright the Brightburn averse seemingly was coming soon. Uh, oh God, the Brightburn averse. But yeah, all of the don't stop believing. I like the I like him just being annoying so he can get upstairs, taking off his clothes in the elevator. Really, really uh, charismatic. The best, you the like best the hang- line from you that like the scene. Angle of the dangle. Yes, yes! <laughs> you like the angle of the dangle. 
<laughs> do you like the angle of the dangle? Oh God! And this is I, a man famous, famously up until this point, he was famous for covering his dangle in whipped cream up until and this putting point. a banana so, up his ass, right? Which I mean, I'm know. pretty sure I used that as a pickup line one time. The angle of the dangle. Yeah. Did it work? No. Ah, uh, gents. But I got on, a good bro. laugh out of it, so you know. <laughs> She could have been a cat lover. Changing. Yeah, she might have been a cat lover too, and you can't trust those. So, <laughs> not, but you, I mean, uh, the statements of the Don are not the statements of Comic Book Click. If you're a cat lover and you subscribe <laughs> and you buy and you buy merchandise, we do not hate you. We, we, we support you. all animals. That's it. That's it. Love your pussy as you want to. Anyway, so um, it turns out that this drive contains credits for a four hundred million dollar transact. Tra- yeah, transfer in Max's name, which he received for selling snooks to international terrorists. They were getting a little convoluted with explaining what that was and what and what it does. To like, I was getting a little like lost. I had to watch that scene twice with the sub with the captions on because it's like, wait yeah. a minute, okay, so you're you're like a Swiss bank, but you're a Swiss bank for other people too because there was more than just there was more than just money on there. There was money on there, invoices, other people's money. There was a all the in- isn't it all the intel is on there? That's how they find out. Yeah, that was, some of the like everyone's Olivia's offshore accounts, the numbers of it, all of it. It wasn't yeah. just Max's. It was like his entire corporations. Right. And again, like all I'm assuming all in the folder that's marked top secret and you just double click it and it's all it's everything that you need. Well, that, <laughs> it's, that I mean, shit is a Rico could, case on steroids. I'm it's, telling it's you, all, it's all clearly labeled and clearly circled like the uh illegal parts are it says do not open <laughs> do not open please this will all put us in jail please do not open top secret plans for world domination but yeah he sees them all he's able to open them all he sees them all let me um, just put in the algorithm encryption they, me. Yeah. <laughs> the, yep i'm gonna trace this back oh look where it goes it goes to the los angeles international port of look. entry that's got to be max's base so they get they figure out that, that if all the money's going there they're gonna go over there plan to attack it, kill Max, and expose the world to his misdoings. All sounds pretty good. All sounds pretty on the up and up. Um, in, M- in Mumbai, Max is wined and dined while the price of the snooks has gone up to $1 billion with the pinky on the mouth. Max cancels the 18-man fire team, even though it has one of Wade's brother-in-laws on it. <laughs> Which, all so that was up. hilarious. Why would you all that was your brother-in-law? Funny. Why would you think, huh? Who's gonna be great for this suicide? He thought he mission? was getting him paid. He thought that Max had money. He was getting him a job, one-time job. Kill these losers. I would just never you guys. go to my sister's incompetent boyfriend and say, "Hey, you want to be on this suicide mission with me?" What are we, some sort of suicide squad? <laughs> <laughs> and Max said, "You know, kill the eighteen-man fire team." He's like, "Do I have to kill him?" He's like, "Kill him, fire him, whatever's easiest." Right. Do they know anything about Clay and his guys? It's like, yeah, brief well, yeah. them. Well, now <laughs> we're back, we're back to them. killing them. Yeah, now we got to go back to killing them. And he's like, uh, anybody that you know? He's like, yeah, it's uh, my brother-in-law. And he's like, don't worry about it. I said I'd kill him. Don't get, get past it. I love that. Yeah, there was like a little slight pause. He gives him a look. He's like, listen, I said I'd kill him. Don't, yeah, <laughs> like, don't give me that look. Don't even worry about that. Um, but yeah, they're putting up the money on the on the uh, Snoop. He is not happy about that. One billion dollars. Um, so he says, don't even worry about the about the fire team because i'm gonna get clay to help us out in this whole one billion dollar thing and i'm like what is going on here i started to think that somewhere along the lines he was going to try to contact him and you know try to get him to defect turns out he seemingly contacted somebody else or was contacted by somebody he else. was definitely contacted by rook yep aisha and clay spend another night together as the team preps for the meeting and pooch spies on his wife which you know that was kind of sweet you know he his wife is pregnant and thinks that he's dead um, we actually saw her be the only one. Nah, to get the she dog definitely tags didn't and think the flag. she's dead. You think that she thinks he's alive? Of course. Always uh, holding I'm, 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 I am a man of visual storytelling, and it, you mm-hmm. do so something so subtle as scratch your arm, and then in a later scene, your arm is literally covered in this giant rash. Right there, you told me that the rash started spreading when once you first scratched it. When right. when everyone was recovering their items. She's like, where's the rings? Yep. Where's the yeah. where's the wedding ring? She yeah. knew instantly because the, the, like he they probably had this little pact of if I die, you're definitely gonna know that you have all my things. You know, like you'll get the rings. Because she knew what he did. He definitely yeah, she, told her what he, what what he did. Yeah, but, but the ring like that, that was a giveaway for her. Yeah. yeah. 
especially yeah. since if they all blew up, how is it his dog tags remained, but the wedding rings just melted in the fire? Yeah, ice make cream any wedding sense. rings. Yeah, and now they now they now that we're going back to this, there's a very kind of sweet moment where uh, Roke is telling him that he should go, that he can go, he mm-hmm. should go. All of them are family. Still, all of them are telling this guy to leave. But but the thing is, it's even more layered when you realize that Roke has already made a deal. He's oh, giving, yeah. he's giving, giving him, an, him out. an out. Like I'm like go because I don't yeah, want to kill he said you. It happened after the Miami incident. So after right. that whole Miami incident, everything after that was already I tr- I turned on you guys. Yeah, so he's urging him to leave, and at yeah. first it just seems like a sweet moment, but now layered with everything we know, he was it was it's even more kind of emotional. He's like it's the, it's the villain showing compassion. Yeah. Um, because he can't sit there and lie anymore. He can't sit there and pretend to be happy for everybody. Just, he knows. just go, man. Yeah, just get out of here. Um, and but- then Clay tells him, he's like, all right, you, Jensen, you know, you guys can, like, hop a boat, hop a plane, do something. Yeah, yeah like, not, everybody was, everyone was, like, no, he was telling Cougar, uh, Pooch, and Jensen to leave, and that him and Roke were going to do it on their own. Oh, yeah. Which means uh, that so- Roke was trying to just get Clay on his own to turn on him like that and get the other guys out of there. So- because he had no oh, hatred so towards dirty. any of them. Oh, that's so damn dirty. Uh, but the thing is, as they're doing this conversation about the family, Jensen's messing around with the computer. So turns out Jensen figures out that the four hundred million that they found and that was transferred was meant for the child of the drug dealer that was killed in Bolivia, who is actually Aisha. We cut back to in bed and Aisha and Clay Pillow talk about Bolivia uh, and the conversation turns hostile because you always want to talk about Black Ops missions in bed. Of course. Right? You know, but I'm you. I'm like, as soon as she starts asking those questions, aren't you a little bit like, hey, uh, can we go back to doing what we were doing earlier? <laughs> can, can somebody bring back that whiskey? But she, she, yeah, keeps trying to pro- probe him about what happened in Bolivia. The losers burst in, guns drawn, and tell Clay Aisha was Fadil's daughter. Fadil's yeah, daughter. Fadil's daughter. Um, she shoots the glass ceiling. She shatters the glass ceiling and uh, re- runs to the bedroom and both sides engage into a firefight, which she manages to escape from. Uh, second time now uh, they've been betrayed by this woman. Third, um, seemingly. Dave, were you, how are you feeling at this moment? Uh, I'm still laughing at the fact that Jensen said she's got a gun pointed at my dick. <laughs> Would it feel better if it was pointed somewhere else? As crazy as it sounds, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Real, real funny stuff. Like, but then, then she pops him in the shoulder, and like he doesn't have his gun because he left it in the van. Because I don't know why. But you know, she's. I mean, Zoe Saldana in her underwear running to the bathroom jumping. I mean, who doesn't yeah. want to see that scene? Yeah, pretty awesome. But stuff. you know, she kicks the door shut. Now, my question is, how did she escape? Because aren't they in like some warehouse? Yeah, it, the, seemingly they were in that. Yeah, that area where they're keeping all their tech. And they're stuff. in a warehouse. First off, why they got a bedroom looking that nice up in there? Yeah, right. They preset this bougie ass love suite up. Like, and, what's she, going on? and she knew how to get out. I still don't a hundred percent know what her game is because if she had the idea that Clay was the guy who did this, she could just shoot him and it would be over. Mm-hmm. And all of this would be over until somebody else told her, "Oh no, it wasn't." But him. she and needed then, them to get to Max. Yeah, yeah. Because Max, because her dad was in on the whole Max thing. I yeah, I remember that now. So. The lose. Oh, I already got to there. Max meets with his weapons dealer while the losers sit around, uh, discouraged and stuff. The they, you know, because the whole meeting is blown. Aisha knows who they are and who their family is, so they're all in danger now. And this is what Dan was talking about when Clay decides to handle the entire problem himself. The rest agree to help expedite the Max mission, and just like that, boom, our team is back. Uh, we get a bunch of assholes standing in a circle, uh, and we're ready to go off. So <laughs> this is that's the obligatory scene, right? That's the obligatory. Absolutely. We're all back together. We all got you. No one's going to be wa- walking there alone. They literally just did it in the Suicide Squad. When he just Alba goes to go alone, they all turn and they are with him. Did you believe this moment, Dan? Did you believe that the losers were all on the same page? At this point, yeah. I mean, but they were never really off the page. Roke is the only Roke. one, right? Roke was the only yeah. one being like disobedient. And, and, and which is really helps because the book, because in the book, he really was the only one that was just like, okay, can we stop doing this shit? Can we stop doing this shit? Like, like yeah. he was more of the reluctant team member. Cause once again, everybody had nothing real. No one had a family. No one had a life. They were just yeah. black ops people. 
That's who they were. It would actually make a lot more sense if they gave broke the family or our family some some kind of stake as to why he went even harder for the betrayal. But uh, yeah, he because he was the one who was pushing just to go home, like from the get go. And like, the whole where are you home? going? Where are mm-hmm. you going? You could have literally just made the best life in a country where five dollars of American is like a hundred dollars. They were making money cockfighting. They were betting on cockfighting and drinking whiskey and going to home with strange Bolivian women. I mean, that doesn't That's sound the dream. too bad. That's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> making money cockfighting, eating in uh, unsanitary bars and restaurants, taking home Listen. strange Spanish women. That's God, it. That does sound like a wonderful life. You know? And he was walking. Jimmy he was trying Stewart to walk away couldn't think of a better one. <laughs> he, was trying to, he was trying to walk away from all that. It's madness. Uh, so they get to the dock where they believe Max is doing his business, but each member is ambushed almost instantly. Roke tells Clay someone tried to set them up and then knocks him out, proving he is the Judas. Uh, he admits to cutting a deal after the stuff in Miami, feeling that all Clay wanted was revenge. Wade lays out the ploy to frame the losers for stealing $1 billion from the CIA while Max uses the stolen funds to buy the snooks. Uh, he seemingly does just that and gets a Ducati for his efforts, but changes his mind and starts to move the money back to his plane. Did you believe this moment where Roke is trying to like tell him like it wasn't personal, bro? You were just kind of going crazy. Um, no, I it, no. it felt personal from the get go, especially when he you saw how I mean he tried to kill Aisha twice yeah. and Clay stopped him. So at that point, the second the first time, I get it. Like, okay, we're not going to kill her, but this, you know, whatever. But the second time when he stopped him, that made it personal because he's like, dude, I'm, I've tried to tell you and you're not fucking listening. And now we catch her. That's Fidel's daughter. And you didn't want to listen. Yeah. I knew something was wrong from Jump Street. And, you know, all right. So you don't trust me. Right. Okay. Well, this other guy does and he pays handsomely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's going to... uh He'll put me on this team. How do you feel about this betrayal there, Dan? Do you who, who can you see any side of uh Roke being right? Uh not really, no. Because at any moment he could have just walked away on his own. Like he if this was all about going home, then Clay was getting there. Like you yeah. gotta trust the process. It's only been four months. To be four fair, they were months. in the States. Yes, you know, and at any moment they could have just walked away. At any moment, yeah. this dude could have just left. But if he did, he's a damn fugitive. Yeah, because initially he wanted to take the hard drive and kind of bargain. Same way that, it's funny, same way that uh, uh, Bloodsport does in the, in the Suicide Squad. Like, yeah. I have all your secrets, let us go. Um, but they were like, if we do that, he'll still find a way to kill us. And he's very disappointed that and that's not the so right And it's so funny going. because in the book, and I think even here too, Max has no idea who the hell these guys are. Oh, he doesn't know them, which hey, makes it. I was a bit confused by the losers' name of this. Really, I don't really find them to be losers. They're not like off like the like well, the dregs of society. Their, so, that's what they called themselves when they in the in the book. Like they like when they meet Aisha, they're like, "Welcome to the losers." Yeah, they mention it once here they, about being losers. Look at us, a bunch of losers or something like that. But it feels like an off title. Like there should have been. I mean, if the film franchise didn't exist, these guys would have been the Expendables. You know. Yeah, essentially, this is the ex- this is the ex- the Expendables meets the Suicide Squad. Yeah, like yeah. like they go on these suicide missions for the government. Only they're not criminals looking for jail time to be taken off. Like they're just doing their job. But yeah, yeah I don't. I yeah, no, I don't buy the the betrayal because it's like you know if if you would have just trusted his process, you would have been home free. Look at the end of the movie; they're all free. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, but but it's just it's it's hilarious. But he had a plane to catch, Dan. He had a plane to catch, and he, yeah, he, he had caught a plane it. To catch. It was a, it was an explosive ride. Um, so yeah, they now they have everybody. Um, the losers are set to be shot and killed when Aisha shows up to their location with an RPG. She shoots it up, and using that as a distraction, and using that distraction to their advantage, the losers neutralize their captors and arm up. Max decides he wants to kill the weapons manufacturer, detonate the weapon, and blame it all on international terrorists so he can start a war and keep the billions of dollars. Uh, where does that rank on, on the mustache-twirling villain plan for you, Dave? Oh, that's, that's mustache-twirling villain 101. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're going to keep the money. You're going to kill the creator and you're going to take all the credit for, you know, you're going to blame somebody else. Like, I mean, if that doesn't scream some of the stuff the U.S. government has done. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yep. Sorry, FBI agent, if you're watching. Yeah, and you know, he is, but he likes he subscribes. So it's, 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 it's all good. It's I all pay good. off the FBI agent. Don't worry. Did you? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, they're seemingly free back with the losers aisha demands clay tell her if he killed her father which is weird because i i thought up until this point it was all book confirmed but i guess she wants to hear it from the man's mouth well she didn't know that clay actually shot her father all oh, she okay. thought was like y'all were like you were there but like the missile blew up the compound because all right. she saw was you know body parts right they she were the ones who laid the, to, they were the ones who what do you say painted the target yeah so they, they they had a hand in it but she wants to know how much of a hand and if his hand was the actual one to pull the trigger and kill her father but yeah now she knows that he did shoot him but you know what he didn't tell her was like he pulled a gun on me like yeah. uh, it's self, it's self-defense and he was he had a child hostage yeah that was that was a thing I popped his ass too like fuck that he tells her at one, he's like, yeah, I killed your dad, but he, you know, he kind of wasn't the nicest guy. And she's like, it doesn't matter, which I guess is also true. It doesn't matter if your dad was the nicest guy. You don't want him to get killed. But again, child, uh, child endangerment at the very least. So um, she basically explains that her dad was just about to bust Max for what he was up to, which is why Max had the whole thing shut down um, and gives her the, the, you know, her focus is now switched from the guy who seemingly did kill her father to the guy who set up the entire mission to get her father killed, which is Max now. Um, so Clay admits the truth and proposes he help her kill Max and she accepts. They get to where the money is and Roke and Clay fight mano y mano, which uh, Roke seems to win. What do you think of that scene, Dave? So I was real hyped for this scene. Because mm-hmm. the second Roke threw that knife from the from the jet or from the stairs to the jet, I was like, yeah. "Oh, it's about to go down." But then you got to see how the fight scene played. Out. <laughs> a man that punch from, man from Jeffrey punches. Dean Morgan to Idris Elba was the. Yeah. It was the laziest fight scene I've ever seen. Like anytime Jeffrey Dean Morgan fell, like the cut was the cut to it was terrible. Um, you know, rope jumping off the steps was so cheesy. At what like, point he, I a thought punch- he was gonna like jump off and hit him with a Superman punch, and all it was, was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. At one point, there's a punch thrown by Jeffrey D. Morgan's character that seems to connect, but when they cut his hand, is like open, it's not even all and the it's way like on like, his face, right? And yeah, yeah, 100%. And like, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, and he gets a, good, a couple good slashes in Roke. But there was three seconds in that fight scene that I love because if you they pan back and they see him going toe to toe, yeah. But they made it look like a, a clip from the comic book, right? They right. they searched up the the videography and made it look straight out of the comic book because you couldn't see them. It was just the silhouettes, the light, the sunlight shining behind them, and like the whole screen was almost yellow. Yeah, and early and on- I thought that was beautiful. They did also something stylistically where as they're engaging in the fight, at one point you seemingly take Clay's POV and all mm-hmm. you see is um, Roke running up to him and throwing his knives. And then the other way around, you get to see yeah. um, Roke's POV and see Clay. What do you think about that fight, Dan? Uh, well, the, like you guys basically hit all the, the beats. It, it, it was just wonky. Yeah. Like the, the, <laughs> the movie did not. The movie was a it was a better movie. If it was a worse movie, I would have just been like, well, I mean, look at the movie. The fight scene definitely stuck to the theme. But yeah. this was a much better movie with a lot more capable fight scenes. Like, we just literally watched Jeffrey Dean Morgan beat the crap out of a, a, a tiny little 90-pound girl. Twice. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but, like, but Roke, he, he but Roke no, is a trouble. Yeah, he yeah, held Roke no punches trouble. there. And, you know, like, and you can't even say, oh, well, I mean, he's fighting a girl. What do you expect? No, nah, we got to. We got to stop with the misogyny and the sexism for a second and put right. it in our head that she can handle him because there was a lot of scenes where she was kicking his ass, too. So that actually is pretty funny. Like when you when you put it back into perspective that he just beat the hell out of a 90 pound woman an hour ago in this film and seemingly has trouble with, you know, one of his mates. But it, I felt like they poised that question early on about who the would between these two. And, I'm also very tired uh, of something like that. They do. They like to do that in team movies where you know there's going to be a betrayal like like with, with suicide squad you didn't know that there was going to be a betrayal with peacemaker and rick flag 
It did yeah. nothing. Nothing led to that. And yes, everything led to the whole tiny bullets and you know, eat yourself and Cena face off. But you would have looked. I would have looked at that as a, they were facing off because they were ha- they, they were having like issues with each other. This was just every time you have a, a teammate that's gonna be a Benedict, there has yeah. to be some sort of running question throughout the whole movie of if these two was to show down who who would walk away who would be the better fighter who would blah 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 blah. but they kept playing on that line of i'm gonna kill you very badly you're gonna die very badly and it's like okay we already know what's gonna happen i actually didn't sniff out this betrayal i guess it's because i didn't remember much from the film and now that i think about it i wouldn't be surprised if james gunn watched this film uh, to do some stuff for Suicide Squad. We were oh, he 100% watched this movie and got knowledge for Suicide Squad. Because there's just, going back and watching this after being like a week removed from Suicide Squad, it's like, whoa. They even had the whole Idris Elba versus Jeffrey Dean, like Peacemaker and Rick Flagg. They had but the thing that- is, the reason why I brought that up, the same thing where you're talking about the Peacemaker and Idris Elba and then in this Clay and Roke, is that we get a betrayal early on. You get the Blackguard betrayal early on. You know, that's that's he, he betrays the team and that seemingly comes out of nowhere the same way the Max thing comes out of nowhere. And seemingly because you already have a betrayal in your bingo card, you check off betrayal. And me, I didn't look for betrayal anymore because I already had the, my betrayal moment, Aisha and Max. So I wasn't looking for anybody else to betray. And the same thing with um, you saw Blackguard betray and then get shot in the face for his efforts. So I didn't expect anybody else in our core team to betray and spoilers for suicide squad if for some reason you're listening to this but not that <laughs> to betray um the whole team there but i i do think he makes a compelling villain idris alba he's just not the villain of this film they just kind of made him the villain to get to take the punch they made him the, the villain end. of the third act and any movie that has their villain become their villain for the third act is not doing too well and it's not going to do too well in the test of time look at yeah. stuff like Eddie Brock in the in Spider-Man 3 or Dean DeHaan in Amazing Spider-Man 2, you know, like you, your villains should not become villains just for the third act. You shouldn't have a surprise villain. Yeah, yes. it shouldn't be a surprise. You should be milking that the whole film. And especially since they did this surprise at the ending of the movie. And this surprise is the beginning of the story for the losers. So you get the rest of, unless they kill him off. You're getting the rest of your time reading the losers where Roke is already a bad guy. Right, right. And he is in full villainy mode because he decides to steal the money. He's like, I'm going to betray Max, steal the billion for myself. Uh, and so Wade gets on a Ducati to stop him. But in route, Cougar shoots the motorcycle. Who's always in like the bird's nest for a man <laughs> named Cougar. They should have named him originally Hawkeye. Like some, called it some sort of bird. Uh, this man is always he, in the nest. And he don't like people touching his hat. We should also I understand him on that. Put that down there. Uh, but yeah, he shoots the motorcycle. The motorcycle blows up. The explosion sends uh, Wade into the plane's engine <laughs> of all places, which then causes the plane to explode. We roke in it. Uh, and it's just a, a hailstorm of, of money, of money and dead bodies and flames. And I love that it they was- didn't even care about the money. Like the money was not even an object to them. Like they just let it stay there. But the happenstance, like the perfect timing of all those things happening and seemingly, you know, open and shut case, they're all done, made me laugh. But it was it was definitely the rule of cool. Like it was so cool that it made me laugh, but I didn't care how, again, like yeah, because that was that literally the last five seconds of the movie. Yeah. How do you That's feel about it. that? Uh, that moment, Dave? Uh, dude, watching Wade. And like getting getting that view of him, like you're the plane engine, you're getting a first person view of Wade flying into you. Like it was so cheesy. <laughs> hand ah! in the way, yep. The whole hand in the in the way. Oh, yeah, God, it was awful. But seeing the flaming motorcycle fly into the cockpit, I that was kind of cool. But it was also the way, like I feel like if a plane's gonna explode, it's not just gonna stop dead in its tracks and just fall apart. I feel like it's yeah, gonna yeah. blow up. So Jeffrey Dean Morgan would have been like hit with some shrapnel. That fuel on there, man, kaboom! Like, like that would... irritated me a little bit. But at the right. same time, it's a movie about fictional. It's a fictional movie, so I'm not gonna critique that too hard. Yeah, like I said, rule of cool. They're just they're just going along with it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, Max goes to escape 
while setting one of the snooks to detonate, but Clay is onto him. Clay pursues Max to a crane where Max says he has activated a snook that will destroy Los Angeles, and Clay will have to choose between those two because that's what good guys do. They have to make the hard choices. Clay chooses to save the people of Los Angeles, and Max escapes, but Clay affirms that he now knows what Max looks like, and he will soon find him. Max escapes to a bus and is robbed by two thugs, a variant of Choloki, apparently. <laughs> 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 rob my man. He's uh, partners. You know they rob him for his watch. I don't know what that means. Was that supposed to tell us something? It tells us that what... LA crime is a lot, and you know you can't <laughs> can't can't trust a Spanish man in a plaid shirt. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Is it like? Is it like? So he didn't get away. Get away because his fate is unknown. He seemingly has a bunch of resources. I'm just he thinking, got away. No, he definitely got away. I'm thinking that it's going on to his whole why he's a bad guy because especially in the book he calls like humans parasites he's like you know like you know this this right. earth is infected but so why like, have him get robbed to show why he is as disassociated with humanity as he is he can't but even then that would make him bus. right wouldn't it that that shows a little bit of weakness on his part he also oh, is a weak, he, he's definitely a weak man yeah that's true when when pushed by another bad seemingly a bad force he kind of folds without wade because I guess Wade was... My man, d- he looked at both of them. Dude comes up, nice watch, Holmes. He looks at them and just picks his arm up. He didn't even take the watch off. Like, he was such a weak dick in that moment where he's like, well, listen, you're going to rob me, sure, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an asshole about it. You can unclip, <laughs> you can unclasp it yourself. Yeah, but who the hell cares? If I rob somebody, but they're giving me a glaring look, I could care I less. That's, I, I already got away it's, it's not the glaring look. It's the, the inconvenience of now I have to put the gun down. I got to unclasp the watch. There you go. There you go. You're inconveniencing can, can we, me. You're inconveniencing my robbery. About, can we talk about how fast he fucking got away, though? Yeah, he already on a bus. Because, like, Clay just gets out of the water. Jensen shows up and the cell phone rings and homeboy's already on a bus to fucking, you know, he's on his way to Hollywood right now. Like, I'm not too certain about the the geography of the L.A. River, but I'm pretty sure there's a bus that can Uh, pass by the L.A. River. But they wouldn't know a, a crazy man bleeding from his shoulder <laughs> running in there. With well, no- like he, he, he seemed to be pretty far <laughs> away. I, I have literally watched the craziest of crazy homeless people get free rides onto the New York City bus. <laughs> hey, can you give me a ride? Yeah. Hey, Maybe they thought he was on? an actor. He was an actor on a, on a bad luck trip. Maybe they, thought they had some sympathy for him. Honestly, I, I think him with a bullet in his shoulders, like, you know what? I'm not messing with this guy. Get on the bus. I truly like Aisha ends up joining the team because the whole thing is she joined to help them stop Max and Max is seemingly not stopped. So she's going to stay on the team. Of yeah, the but team. she didn't also she also continued to stay so that when Max is dead, her and Clay can have a fight to the death. I thought they were going to dance. Was it, does she really mean like dance fight? Like well, that's what good? dance means. Yeah, it was a oh, colloquial. Okay. She was like, "We're we're gonna finish yeah. that dance." Like you know, they they they've used that term dance for fighting in so many movies. Like you and me are gonna finish that dance. Like uh, so she's. I've heard that uh, colloquial so many times. He has a whole. She has a whole. Uh, and Chris uh, Evans actually said it in a movie, and I can't remember what one where he looked at his adversary and he's like, "Let's dance." I'm pretty huh. sure that was Scott Pilgrim. I think so too, because it. Ha- I'm, I'm picturing Lucas. You want right to dance, now. douchebag? I think that's what now, he said. Now, <laughs> now I gotta look into see if there's a mention of a dance in every Chris Evans film, because we know the Captain America films are all about the last dance. Oh, so maybe that's a, but that's, maybe that's a different kind of dance. Maybe he puts it in his contract. We need to talk about dancing at all points. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he dances in Snowpiercer. There you go. Uh, what's interesting is I think my favorite part of the film actually comes at the end. Shortly thereafter, yes. the losers uh, pull off their final mission of the film and help Pooch reach the hospital where his pregnant wife is giving birth to their son. Uh, I love how they made that a mission, too, by the way. I like yeah, how they were talking so awesome. in code names and they're all rocking the black. We got to get him in. Is he in? Hey, just get to the package. All of that stuff was really, really cute. It, 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 that kind of stuff, the kind think, of world they're, in, they're from and trying to like blend into the real world is going to be hard for them. Yeah. And I mean, they're still seemingly burnt, burnt. They're still seemingly on the cusp. Oh, they're yeah, they are still mask. burnt, probably. They have to stop mask, Max to be able to be regular citizens again. And seemingly they're going to use their weird resources to try to stop him. But later on, our oddballs attend Jensen's eight-year-old niece's soccer game, and he gets into it with the ref. And this is when I, this is when I immediately hit you up. Where I'm like, yo, I think Chris Evans might be the greatest actor I've ever seen because <laughs> There is no way that this scene was just so 
damn funny. It was well yeah. put together. Man screaming at the, you don't deserve to wear those stripes. You don't just. The chest bump from the ref had me. That was great. She's like, come on, come on. <laughs> and he chest bumps her back. Like this, I this think he finds out. NBA. I think he finds out that one of them bet on the opposite team or something. And he gets it was, very uh, upset. It was Aisha. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aisha yeah. bet 100 on, on, on the yellow jackets or whatever. You bet against the Petunias? Big mistake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah man. He gave all me about points. <laughs> 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 no, but this was, uh, this was a hell oh, of a. Go ahead, the man. other part. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dude. The other part where the baby needed a diaper change. And oh, he, and yeah. He looks at Clay and he's like, Clay, you want to you jump on this? He's like, I'd rather jump on a live grenade. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not I'm not about that life at <laughs> all. Yeah, I yeah I, I, as, as someone that has changed his niece's diapers, yeah, I, I'd rather jump on a live grenade too. <laughs> I, I really dug this though. I dug going back to it. I do feel like it's a film of its time and, and like how the villain is set up and stuff and seemingly the comic – uh, wasn't written too far away from when this film was made. So all of it kind of circles around the same subject matter and stuff. But I would be really down to revisit this with these actors again. I know, Dan, you mentioned it. I know, Dave, you'd be down as well. But like they have they are so now matured in their roles, all of them, you know, from top to bottom. I mean, Jeff D, Jeffrey D. Morgan has been like one of the leads of Walking Dead for the last three years or something like they they have full franchises on their back almost every one of them in this film at the point um so it'd be really cool to see them portray their acting chops uh in another go around with this because it was, this wasn't a bad film at all i really liked the camaraderie that was in it i like that as, so, as somebody who's constantly doing these shows and doing these synopsis synopsi um you can get bogged down with just details and they didn't have many in this, but it's just a joyride. It's a joyride with very enjoyable characters, a very easy to follow um, story and uh, a satisfying ending, even though the, the, it leaves the door open for sequels and stuff. Dave, what do you think overall when all is said and done? Overall, I thought it was a great movie. It was very entertaining, very entertaining. If I took away anything from that movie, it was so entertaining and it, and it kept me in because I wanted to see what would happen next. Yeah. Uh, as far as it goes for, you know, for a comic book movie perspective and, you know, I didn't read any of the source material for it, so I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. However, from what Daniel was saying, you know, they they pulled a lot of good points from the comics. Yeah. But then they embellished them on their own. Right. Um, I One thing I want to bring up is the most underrated line in the movie to me. It's when uh, Max and Wade are, are at the uh, set of Goldeneye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh <laughs> He says, what, what, what am I looking at in these pictures? It's Clay and his unit. Clay and his unit. unit. It's yeah. like a bad porno, <laughs> Wade. <laughs> but over, overall, I gave it probably seven and a half out of ten stars. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Uh, Dan, now imbued with your comic knowledge, how do you feel about this film uh, going forward? Uh, the, the 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 film definitely loses a lot of points for me. Like if I didn't go and back, if I didn't go and read at least some of this comic, and I just watched straight up this movie, oh, ten out of ten all the way because it gets points for entertainment. It's funny, action packed, great cast that all becomes the biggest names in comic book movies in seemingly only less than five years. Four of these people become like the greatest names in comic books. Yeah, like there's a lot of this movie wins for me. But then when I but now that I have been blessed with stuff like Umbrella Academy and Doom Patrol and the boys where they take these giant worlds with compact stories and they decide to give you three seasons. Yeah, uh, I think this this movie would work better. This property would work better as a as a show. Serialize it, make it three to four seasons, probably four seasons. Make it make it a good four seasons. You know, make each season like twelve episodes, mm -hmm. and this would this would kill the pop culture world. This would take the pop culture world by storm. You, if this movie, if this movie becomes a show next year by twenty thirty, you're gonna have everyone wearing the poot the pooch uh, shirt or the cowboy hat, <laughs> and the cougar, and the petunias go petunias. Yeah, every, everyone's gonna be wearing the pink go petunia shirt and have the little pooch <laughs> bobblehead on their car, like. This yeah. this property has the has the potential to own fandom, but there's no trust there. There was definitely yeah. no. There was a little trust, but there yeah, was that budget. <laughs> it was that budget, man. That but if they would have had an extra an extra ten million, 
I know saying it out loud coming from people that make like $15 an hour. Whoa, 10 million. Imagine what I could do with 10 million. But from the studio's perspective, if this studio would have just coughed up just two more zeros on that check, just write yeah. two more zeros. I feel like their whole their whole budget would pay for just Chris Evans now nowadays. <laughs> like that, oh, that's what all that would go. That's to. why if you do this, if you do this as a show, get a whole bunch of new actors. Get get the younger siblings of other actors. And, and you know, instead of having to fork over the, the hundred million for Chris Hemsworth, get Liam. Put Liam in. Yeah. Put Liam as Jensen. You know, or, or Liam as as Clay. Like get some yeah. young unknown actors. Get the kid from the Naked Brothers band, Alex Wolf. Get that dude in here as Pooch or Cougar. <laughs> Hell yeah. If you guys have seen Hereditary or even get Dev Patel. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Get Dev Patel yeah. as, as Roke. Dev Patel, Alex Wolf, and Liam and Liam Hemsworth would. You oh, have to throw Millie, you have to throw Millie Bobby Brown in there because she gets thrown in everything. So we're just, oh, <laughs> we'll just shove, make make Millie shove. Bobby Brown Aisha. There you go. Uh, maybe. I know, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I was getting, I was getting, I was definitely getting uh, Mission Impossible 2 Tandy Newton vibes from uh, Zoe Saldana in this. Oh mm-hmm. man, but anybody that gives me Tandy Newton vibes is, is a win for me because Tandy Newton, the original Zoe, <laughs> Tandy Newton is the original Zoe Saldana. That's one of the original Bond girls of our yeah, generation. Man. Yes, I think so, she was in so Never uh, Die, Die, uh, what's it called? Live, Live Another Day or something like that. Die Another Day, Die Another Day. I think she was in Die Another Day, one of yeah. those. One of those Pierce Brosnan sequels. The thing is, like you like Tandy Newton and like all the actors in this, like since they've made this film, they've gone on to do great, great things. And I even think from here on out, from us reviewing it going forward, there's nothing stopping them from all hitting uh, you know, the tops of their respective fields. And that's what we aim to do here. We're hoping to continue to be the latest and greatest uh, thing to come to comic books and comic book media. Where now this episode is officially our 190th episode. Oh my god! So remember when? Remember it's, when two years <laughs> was was episode 100? That's crazy, ain't it? At 190 episodes, we haven't missed a single week. Knock on vibranium. But um, it was also doing all the bleh, doing all this free of charge for you guys each and every week, and you know already because you found this episode somehow that every single episode of the major issues podcast is available at comicbookclick.com. We have our own website, people. It's where our merchandise lives. It's where articles written about every contributor to comic book click, uh, actually exists. We have about us sections. We have a shop with exclusive designs made by myself in our T public store. So you can go ahead and help us there by supporting us and getting some cool merch. You get two, you knock two birds, uh, with one stone, you get cool merch and you're able to help us, uh, keep the lights on over here. If you go to comicbookclick.com, there's a big old button there. It says support comic book click. If you click on that, you could become a patron of everything comic book click. We like to keep do all these stuff and keep it free of charge for you guys. But it's a lot of work sometimes and keeping the lights on is not always easy. So you can go ahead and for as little as $3 a month, 10 cents a day. You can help independent content creators like ourselves. Matter of fact, you could just help us <laughs> by go ahead and donating that. And we'll continue to provide all the stuff we do free of charge, but you'll get access to exclusive content like CBC commentaries where you can sit down with me and Dan as we watch Dark Phoenix and talk crap about it for two hours. So isn't that, doesn't that sound like fun? Go ahead and get on that uh, while you can. So support us on Patreon if you have the money to. If you don't want to do that, try to buy a piece of merch. It helps us out greatly. But if you want to support us, maybe not monetarily, maybe things are going a bit rough right now. Delta variant, it's out and being rampant. Why don't you just rate and review us on iTunes? It's the quickest way for us to grow as podcasters and find out what you like and what you don't. Because I've been to the future where this podcast does become the latest and greatest thing to come to comic books and comic book media. But I can't tell you how it happens or else I mess up the timeline. So find us wherever podcasts are found. Podbean, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, the Apple Podcast app, TuneFind, Spotify, YouTube, and more. The quickest way, though, go to Google. Type in Major Issues Podcast, and we were the first ones to pop right up, because like I said, we're always talking about the newest, hottest, latest, and greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media. 
there's been a bit of a schedule change. We got some things up in the air now that Venom has moved because we had the entire fall schedule planned out, but that's seemingly messing up a bunch of things. But next week, if I'm not mistaken, we'll be tackling Batman uh, Soul of the Dragon, one of the more recent DC animated films, but mostly we're covering it because it's full of DC, the DC characters that are known the best for their hand-to-hand skills. We're preparing for Shang-Chi, which is set to come out in a couple weeks and is supposedly one of the best uh, martial arts films Marvel has created to date. I don't know what else would be considered in that iron fist. I guess don't watch iron fist people. It's not worth it, but (laughs) it's not, I'm trying to save the people with some things, but yeah, go. If you got a chance, go see soul of the dragon, come back here next week. where we'll be tackling that. Um, But you know, before we, I go ahead and sign off, Dave has been, a pleasure having you on here, bro. It's been super cool. I feel like just another another friend over to chat about some films and stuff. Dude, uh, it's just so it, super cool. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure, man. I appreciate you having me on. Um, you know, I, I have loved this movie since I first saw it eleven years ago, and I will continue to watch this movie on repeat every now and again. You know, it, it's it's just that good of a movie. It's got rewatch value. Yeah. And, you know, I may go, you know, a little bit of time, but I'll still always go back to it. It's sitting right over there on my Blu-ray shelf, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. But uh, Talking about this movie, it just it, it brings me back to 11 years ago. And I appreciate getting some of that nostalgia, j- not just from the movie, but from that that time in my life. So it was real. It was real good to relive some of those days. So I appreciate you having me on. Oh, definitely. And people, 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 I will go ahead and put this link in the show notes wherever you're listening to this episode of the podcast, whether it's on on our actual website or any podcast player inside the show notes will be a link to the Department of the Nerds podcast. But you people know how to spell right in Facebook. Subscribe now. They're having live shows. You know, when you come home, you're just not feeling like doing nothing. You just want to hear people talk about the things that you want to talk about, the things that you've just seen. Well, these guys do that and more. The camaraderie is off the charts. I am going to be there. Uh, for a lot of these episodes, if not all of them, you know, fingers crossed, um, but they're killing it over there at the Department of the Nerds podcast. So make sure that you're liking, subscribing, tell a friend to tell a friend. And again, it's one of the coolest and fun live shows out there. Be a part of it, participate. And I even tell you this, if you can go ahead and get enough good people, enough of your loser friends to come in and watch the Department of the Nerds podcast live, you might see a grown man eat an onion. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not even going to talk about anything else past that. You're just going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to go ahead and watch and figure it out up until then. But uh, that seems to be the end of this. We're tapering this off. So my name is George Serrano, a.k.a. The Don. I am Dan, the comic book man. And I am Dave of the Department of Nerds podcast. Not cool enough for a nickname yet. We're getting there. We're getting there because you're going to be here next week, pooch. We're going to find a way to get you around. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this has been our The Losers recap and review. And remember, whether you think sex and fighting and dancing is the same thing, whether you're a weapons expert, a demolitions expert, whether you're a uh, Benedict Arnold in disguise, or you just look good in brawn panties like Zoe Saldana, remember that we're not losers. Remember that we are the clique. And always remember that you, yes, you are worthy.